all white members of the outlawed African National Congress. We were told that he was our father, but we didn't know what that meant because he wasn't in our life. I do not think of myself as an activist at all. That's something that my mom and father did. I was just a kid caught up in the mess. Traveling was something that I thought that families did. We just happened to be a traveling family. In the 1980s, the apartheid government labelled this man, Damien de Lange, a terrorist. You can go back to the, the speech of Nelson Mandela, which in some ways sums it up, that there becomes a point in the, in the history of a nation where you either submit or fight. In June 1981, Damien bombed the Johannesburg offices of the Progressive Federal Party, a largely English-speaking liberal party. It was 20 years since the formation of the South African Republic, but the PFP was notably absent from a series of protests and boycotts. In Damien's eyes, this meant the PFP supported the regime. Maybe I was foolish, but I was convinced that I had to do something is what made me do what I, had to, what I did to the PFP. In the end, it was actually Bayez Nordia who came to me who just said, look, what you're involved in is not correct. I will introduce you to the people who you should be with and where your kind of your motivation and your skills can be used for what you really want to do or you continue with what you're doing and then I don't want anything to do with it. Damien took Bayer's Nordia's advice to join a more organized liberation movement. By then, the 23-year-old newspaper journalist was already on the most wanted terrorist list for the PFP bombing. Just as his anti-apartheid activism kicked up a gear, another chapter in his life was being written. I was pregnant, six months pregnant by that time. He had to leave the country. Um, I had a choice whether to um, make arrangements to come with him after he left or to stay. And obviously I, I, I wanted to go with him. Together, Damien and Diana left South Africa, joining up with the ANC in Botswana. Damien's role as a liberation fighter was clear. As a new father to twin boys, though, he would be an enigma, his life a mystery. It's the eve of South Africa's 20th anniversary of democracy. That's it. <laughs> Jack, can you see who's here? Yeah. No. I think this is me. Yeah, that's definitely me. Charles is the fat kid. <laughs> Seamus and Kieran de Lange, now in their 30s, reflect on their early years. A 
As children, their life was one of disruption and upheaval, a constant journey between Botswana, Tanzania and Zambia. The De Lange twins now want to find out for themselves why they moved so much, what tore their family apart, and why their father wasn't present in their lives. Only later, when we became adults, we wanted to know more about it. Mm. So it wasn't something that you discussed over a dinner table. You kind of just, I don't know, maybe just carried on. The answers are scattered across the continent. It's actually one of the questions I, I think I still have to ask my parents at, at my age now, and maybe I should have done it uh, sooner, was why they didn't impart that sort of information. The twins are embarking on a voyage back in time to a community that shaped their early years, an ANC settlement in Morogoro, Tanzania. Shulu Mashlate was a close friend from that time. He stayed in touch with the community, providing the link the De Lange twins need to piece together their past. Tanzania was a key ally in the fight against apartheid. The ANC set up offices and camps here. It became home to many exiles, as well as a transit point for freedom fighters heading to various training centers around the world. In the east of the country is the Solomon Mahlangu Freedom College. Originally known as Mazimbu, it was built in 1977 to accommodate and educate South African exiles. The previously barren sisal farm had been donated to the ANC by the Tanzanian government. It took fundraising efforts by leaders such as Oliver Tambo to develop it into a residential area with its own nursery school, primary school, high school and clinic. In 1985, it was renamed after Solomon Rachlangu, who had been hanged by the apartheid government. The De Lange twins and Lolo Mahlati lived here in the 80s. When we were driving here, I was even expecting memories to you know, surprise me. This is about the only place that I have a vague familiarity with. There was like a little bit of a connection. That was about it. But I don't, uh, I don't remember anything here. I really don't, it's so strange. Maybe I was too young. This is where there was a sense of security. There was a lot of love. If there's one thing that was done correctly, it is to care for the kids. When we were in Mazimbo, we didn't know English. 
And so a lot of the memories that we have, you know, you, you can see someone in my mind, I can see myself talking to someone, but my brain can't translate what that is because I can't speak Zulu anymore. So it's, it's a very strange thing. It's like I can't remember what, I can only remember the emotion of the process. But you don't actually know what I can't know. really remember. It's, very, it's a very strange thing because it's, it's very sad that I can't speak Zulu. And in fact, if I, we had carried on speaking Zulu for another two years, we would have been fluent. I went to an uh, uh, amazing. I was angry about funding so Mrs. Zul. Babies funded la bona lab. Each and every child, ebe me me kuluma nabo, ebe kulu Mrs. Zul. They said, oh, au au zwane, lala pants. Uti uti uti. What what does that mean? And they they learned from each other. Yeah. We just spoke to them, and the children were the best teachers for, for their peers. The children from an early age of three are made aware of why they are here in Mazimbu and why some of them don't have their parents here. Most problems we have are social problems, especially for those children who don't have their parents. There was a song, as I found this one, one of my comrades was a, was a camp. He was a commander. Yaiti, uh, 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 freedom is coming tomorrow. And then Uti, in South Africa, all children will be running Emma Park, Lago Corner, Emma Flowers, Beshega, Kungeko Zinyembeze, Kungeko anything. And that song just made all the children long for home. I don't I don't know if you remember them. Over there there used to be a pipe pipe. Part of the Tanzanian way of being and supporting the struggle was to sing struggle songs, South African songs and so on. That's outside of this community. Inside of this community, there was cultural evenings and taught about the history, both within the school, but outside through conversation. So we felt very much a South African, it was a South African community. There was a deep sense of being a South African but trying to reconcile it with, then why are we not home? Why are we not in South Africa? And then that's how you, I guess, engage with where we were in terms of history. Look, the good stuff is that you're always with people. You're never lonely. You feel part of a, a great big family that all thinks the same way and is trying to achieve the same thing. I think it's very important that South Africans understand that in those times of trouble that there were other homes that South Africans could go to, to be secure. It's very important that South Africa doesn't forget that countries like Tanzania supported them through the struggle. I don't think we would be where we are today without the care of these people. And I think we were very easy to forget the people who helped us. 
coming here has reminded me that that process took place. The twins' journey has shown them how so many other families have similar histories. Importantly though, they are understanding the enormous sacrifices their parents made. It does cross your mind as to how someone manages as a parent with two kids, apart from the danger of being a new, new environment, you're also part of a, a struggle which kind of has its own elements of danger and you know, how do you make sure your kids are well fed, don't get sick, are still going to get the kind of education they should. So yeah, you do think about that and I, I do believe both of them did a good job. I think my mother did an astonishing job. As well as raising the twins in Mazimbu, Diana volunteered as a teacher. By now, their father Damien was in Angola, having joined the ANC's armed wing, Umkonto Wesizwe, Spear of the Nation. They called it Commander's Course. We covered 10 subjects. It was in the camps of central, the central highlands of, of Angola. What I wanted to do was to leave to join the ANC and become part of the armed struggle. Then I thought, what is my contribution? My contribution is to be a soldier. I don't have money to give the movement. So I'm not a clever person. I don't have a degree. I can't give them knowledge. So like the rest of us here, will be soldiers. Obviously you think about your children. You also realize that other people have got children and people have got children in South Africa. Bulk of them are under the heel of apartheid. But hopefully my children and other people's children will have something better. You people, let's get out now very quickly, okay? Probably the first two, three months in Angola, it was very difficult, very difficult. Every Sunday I wrote to the mother, because I received nothing, I stopped. After two years in the bush, Damien received a package from a friend who lived in Mazimbu. A welcome surprise for the exhausted and lonely soldier. And in the box was some photographs of two white boys with distended stomachs. And I think these are my children. Chambers and Kieran got very, very ill, gastric enteritis, and they had to go to hospitals. The impact of the gastric enteritis was that they couldn't digest food properly. So they had a form of almost like kwashioko. So their, their legs and arms were terribly thin, and they had these terribly distended stomachs. What do you do? You cry. You realize that things are going to be sacrificed and it is going to be painful. You do have to focus and say, this is what I have to do. Yes, I don't want them to die. They are my children. I want them to have something better. It would be two years before Damien saw his boys again. But to them, he was a complete stranger. They talk Zulu to one another. And now here, these two boys are talking Zulu. So I say, Gil, And they're calling the mother. The mother was somewhere else. And then the mother arrived. And then she tries to tell them, this is your father. Soon, the family was on the move again, this time to Zambia.
Despite being back together, they were far from united. For me also was very difficult. Coming back from Angola and realizing that Diana and I would, we, it was not working as two human beings. And then trying to make it work because it should not fall apart because I've spent two years in Angola. We should be able to sort those issues out. And then realizing that you can't. And it took a while and it took a lot of pain. And at the same time, you hide it from the ANC because the ANC had its own rationale around families. When Diana says, it's over, it's almost like amputating something that you know you must amputate. It was never, how could you do this to me? It, that just didn't enter into it. It was just more fear of how I was going to cope with the children alone. I couldn't imagine a life without him. I'd gone into exile, really, to be with him. So it was rough, but I don't think there was ever a moment of, I don't want you to do this. difficult for all of us but I think as a child you don't really express a lot of the difficulties that we were going through at the time. Because mm, um, you also need something to compare it against that was normal for us. <laughs> yeah I think it was very normal for us we just thought yeah. it was that was life. But you don't really know the full scope of what's going on so I think getting that information now you kind of say well it, it was difficult um, and um, I'm sure they did their best given the information they received as well as the environments they were in. What they initially thought was a normal life is becoming more complex as the Delanger twins connect their past. But exactly why their father was sent to prison is the biggest piece still missing for them. Twins Seamus and Kieran DeLunger are trying to come to terms with their unusual past and why their family was pulled apart. Their quest to better understand why their father Damien went to prison has led them to this farmhouse in Brudestrum, west of Pretoria. After their parents separated, the twins stayed in Zambia with their mother, Diana. Their father, Damien, had returned to South Africa and lived in this house. Seamus and Kieran met their father's former neighbor, Lorraine Borsoff. In May 1988, the Brudestruem house hit the headlines. Police have arrested four white members of the outlawed African National Congress. According to the Law and Order Minister, Adrian Flock, their arrest led to the seizure of the largest single consignment of guerrilla weaponry ever found in South Africa. 
Damien DeLanga, Ian Robertson, Susan Westcott and Hugh Lugg, all in Contawissi's where operatives had been smuggled back into South Africa in 1987. Part of their secret underground mission was to provide weapons and explosives to other MK comrades in the country. Well, it was frightening. I, I, I wouldn't be lying if I said it wasn't. It was frightening. You're a soldier, you're part of a liberation uh, the armed wing of a liberation movement, this is your work, this is what you should be doing. You realize when you join a struggle like that, you make a, a, a choice. You either um, you come back to the country illegally, you're either killed in battle, or you're arrested, or you remain underground. Damien had a South African passport in the name of Colin Becker, and I was Kate Becker. Damien was a landscape gardener, um, and I was a housewife. That was our story. We found it through an advert in one of the newspapers. We needed to move on because one of uh, our security in the previous place was compromised. The house in Brudersturm is an accident of history. A house that we managed to rent in a rural area, in some ways maybe a bit of a right-wing area. We were whites. Racism blinds people. So white people see white people as being one with themselves. I carried a pistol the whole time. If I went into a place where they collected my firearms, you handed in your firearm, you took your ticket, you took your firearm. No one ever asked you for a license. I mean, I was white. Lorraine Bosoff became intrigued by her new neighbors. It was strange working at night, but I thought, you know, that's just maybe their business. Um, that they've got to work at night and not during the day. Yeah, and I think they were sleeping during the day. Never saw them around, really. We also went out in the daytime to keep our cover story that some of us were business people and teachers, and we'd leave in the uh, early morning uh, and come back late afternoon. Obviously, the work had to continue, so we did work at night but we tried to be as, uh, as quiet as possible and, and, and not make too much noise. In a sense, that was our operational place. That's where we made explosives. That's where we kept arms. That's where we planned our operations from. We're going into military bases. We're taking photographs. We're making drawings. We're sending this out. We're going to the border. We're collecting ammunition. We're manufacturing explosives. We start blowing up things. Uh, we operated for a while until one of the guys in the group lost his nerve. My kids were on their way, walking up to the road to um, go to Sunday school, waiting for the bus to pick them up. But halfway up, um, police chased them back. I saw people sitting on the veranda. It must have been 8.30, quarter to nine on Sunday morning. And I thought, that's very odd. It was early to mid-May, so it was getting pretty cold. Why would they sit out on the veranda at that time of the morning? There was no sun uh, in that area on the veranda. Then when I went back to my room, 30 minutes later, I heard gunfire and footsteps. Then I put two and two together and realized that that must have been security police sitting there in the next door neighbor's property. According 
According to the Law and Order Minister Adrian Fluck, their arrest led to the seizure of the largest single consignment of guerrilla weaponry ever found in South Africa. And next thing we hear some shots. And there were a lot of police. And literally within seconds, there were guys with rifles pointing at us. The bedroom was just full of weapons. What could have happened if we'd had any more warning? The, the possibilities are not pleasant. Just being innocent neighbors to activists under surveillance didn't spare Lorraine's family the wrath of the security police. Apparently one of the cars that lived here had a beard and then the police got confused. They broke down our back door took my husband, put him next to a tree, said he must stay there. I had to sit on the stoop. My three small children stayed inside. They wouldn't let me go inside or they come outside. They knew we were uh, an ANC unit operating there. When there was a pillowcase over my head, I realized that there are only three of us who were stretched out on the lounge floor not four of us. I noticed it was myself, Damien and Ian. And the other bedroom where Hugh was, nobody came out. And I heard one of the security police in there saying, hey, let's do it. And I thought they'd shot him because it's the first bedroom closest to the entrance. So I thought he's dead. And to me, that was the explanation why I never saw him. The group would later discover that Hugh Lug, the fourth member of the unit, had betrayed them and turned state witness. The Brudis through him three, as they became known, were charged with treason. Damien was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Ian, 20 years, and Susan, 18. After the unbanning of the ANC in 1990, Seamus and Kieran were allowed to visit their father in prison. It was their first time in South Africa. I think the whole thing of coming back home was a very strange thing for us. Well, it was a strange thing for me. I didn't understand what that meant. Because we were just living in this place. I think when we stayed in Zambia, it did feel like home. I mean, I, you know, it didn't feel like we weren't home. So when we said we were, I remember being told we're flying home, or we're going to South Africa, which was a very strange thing. It was just, oh, we're going to this country. It was difficult. I had been informed by the lawyers that, look, there's going to be this visit, and it's going to be, I think it was sponsored by the Red Cross. And Seamus and Kieran would come into the country, and that they'd be able to visit me. When we're going into the prison stuff, I think the people around us were more worried than we were. You know, poor kids, you know, what are they going through? And we were, I remember being completely chilled out, just, we're just gonna go and see a guy in a ring. I remember it was very cold and very loud. Because they have to open like a bajillion gates. I hugged them and greeted them. And of course, I have, a, I have a life and I have a family and I have a mother and father and brothers. And of, this is something that you've, you never disclose when you're in exile. And I said to them, okay, did Kieran fetch you at the airport? Kieran being their, their uncle, my brother. And they both looked at me and said, yes, he did. And he's your brother. And I, say, I initially said, of course he's my brother. And then they said to me, I think it was Kieran that she said, and he's not your only brother, you've got other brothers. And suddenly it dawned on me that in a small amount of time, they had been exposed to the fact that, in essence, I had lied to them. That suddenly this was disclosed to them, that 
Actually, there's a whole other side to their father that they don't know. During the day, what did they do? Sleep during the day, work during the night. Okay. On the cot. On the cot. I met Damien, I mean, aside from when we first met him in jail, was that I had, the, you know, a resentment as to an explanation. I mean, why, why now, who are you? It, it wasn't like people describe, you know, their fathers who they knew that left. It was, this person is your father, you know, you're going to get to know him. It was, it's a, a, bit, a bit of a, a different dynamic. When we were growing up with Dai, I don't think Dai ever spoke badly of Damon, ever. It was never like that at all. I think we just grew up and Damon just wasn't a feature just because he was never around. It's not so much guilt, maybe a little bit of resentment, if I'm honest, that they didn't have the benefits of a, of a normal childhood, of a really beautiful normal childhood. Part of the casualties are the interconnectedness that you get out of a family. We just didn't have that, though we only had that really with, well, when we were growing up, we really had that with Di. To address his absence, Damien is at Constitution Hill with Seamus and Kieran, as well as the three children he had with Susan Westcott. Once a place where political prisoners were incarcerated, Constitution Hill is now a symbol of reconciliation and progress. Yeah, I think we're being like completely removed from this part of yeah. our history. I don't even. Even when you say history, it's not, it's not part of my life and part of my history, it's, it's part of my father's life and history. Although he was never held here, Damien hopes the visit reflects his own background, helps his children understand the choices he made, and explains why he lived the life he did. The whole cell is closed, so what they're doing is they're basically putting people in, sealing them off. I'm sure it was more, this was more like punishment. There's this huge world of information and history that's out there to, to be understood and actually looked at more closely. <laughs> I think you dream of the future and what it could be. A one South Africa, multi-party democracy, it would reflect the aspirations of South Africans and it's supposed to be a democracy that we participate in and that we hold accountable. So that is what we dreamed and that's what we fought for. We weren't fighting for privilege, we were fighting for equality. South Africa isn't quite what we want or what we dreamt about, but by no means is it a pre-94 South Africa. The way I, I feel is that the, the whole process has been such a journey of discovery and it feels like there's so much we have learned about what happened, what we were actually involved with, who, who our parents really were. That connection just wasn't there that father and son have. But I think we've really worked at it now and I think things are a lot better. 
my children, Seamus, Kieran, Sean and Siobhan, Ashley, other children, young people, it's up to you guys now to actually seize the opportunity. Maybe we just built the foundation.